In today's video, I'm gonna do a walkthrough of the writing section of SAT Practice Test 10. I've scored perfectly on back-to-back -back SAT writing sections, and as I go through these questions, I'm gonna show you the most efficient way to answer each and every one. So with all that being said, make sure to like and subscribe, and let's go ahead and get started with the first passage. So we take a look at our first passage. It's titled, How a Cat in the Hat Changed Children's Education. So the way that I approach the writing section is I read through the passage, and as I do so, I answer the questions. So let's go ahead and start going through it. So we have in a 1954 Life Magazine article, author John Hersey expressed concern that children in the United States were disengaged from learning how to read. Among other problems, Hersey noted the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. In this case, the answer is going to be no change, okay? We would say and with because that's redundant. And also is also redundant and competing with. We would re be repeating competed with, which we already said. So to avoid repetition and redundancy, we would answer with answer choice A. Next, we have one solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting. Since, and then I read question two at this point, the writer wants to include a quotation by Hersey that supports the topic of the passage, which choice best accomplishes this goal. Well, to understand what the topic of this passage is, I need to read on before I can answer to. So I simply start and I'm going to come back to it after I've answered probably up to like question eight or so. So the story of the Cat in the Hat's publication began when William Spaulding, and I have a comma, the director of the education division at the publishing company Hewton Mifflin, read Hersey's article and had an idea. Okay, I see that this is a non-essential phrase or clause. Now, the reason I know that is because if I was to take out everything I'm crossing out right now, everything between these two commas, the sentence would still make sense. So because I know it's a non-essential phrase or clause, I need to offset it with either a comma and a comma, or parentheses and a parentheses, or an M dash and an M dash. Now, in this case, since I end with a comma, I have to do commas. Therefore, my answer here is also going to be no change. So my answer for three is no change. All right, moving on. Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers. Now, I'm assuming I'm going to be asked for combining these sentences at the underlying portion, which I see that I am. The reason I knew that is because it was end of a sentence followed by beginning of a sentence. Now, to combine these two, what we want to make sure we're doing is, once again, avoiding repetition and redundancy, but also we want to make sure that we're writing something that's grammatically correct. So if we look at our answer choices, I, one thing that jumps out to me immediately with answer choice C, we have a semicolon and then the word and. We wouldn't want to do that, so we can go ahead and get rid of C. Answer choice D, we have a comma and then we have and meanwhile. He Adding meanwhile there is just adding words. It's not being concise. We want to be concise. We want to be efficient in our word choice. So D is also going to be incorrect. Looking at answer choice B, we have readers and then we have a dash. Namely, he thought he knew who should write one. Right there, we wouldn't want to do namely. Okay, once again, we're just adding a word there that doesn't need to be there. So that would be inconcise. That's not efficient in our word choice. Our answer here has got to be A. We see that it's connecting two independent clauses using a comma and a fanboy. Okay, the second independent clause being he thought he knew who should write one. The first independent clause obviously coming uh, before this period, which we'll obviously be removing and putting in a comma in the word and. But the reason A is correct is because it's concise, it's efficient in word choice, and it's grammatically correct. All right, moving on. So we got, he arranged to have dinner with Theodore Geisel, who wrote and illustrated children's books under the names Dr. Seuss, and issued him a challenge. Write me a story that first graders can't put down. All right, now we've got having known Spalding for many years. So we're asked for which choice best supports the information that follows in the sentence. So we need to read on. So we're going to have Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator. So what we're putting in for number five it needs to be something that's showing that Geisel was experienced in writing and illustration. So answer choice A does not show that. It just talks about a relationship between Spalding and Geisel. Answer choice B says acquired a reputation for perfectionism for setting high standards. That's also going to be incorrect because we need to highlight his experience in illustration. Answer choice C says been interested in politics before breaking into children's literature. That's not showing his uh, experience in illustration and answer choice D published nine children's books and having received three nominations for the prestigious Caldecott Medal, okay, showing that he has experience now in writing and illustration. So our answer there is going to be D for number five. Next thing, number six, I've got one word beginning of a sentence followed by a comma that's telling me I need to properly transition from my previous sentence into my next sentence. So in my previous sentence, I was talking about Geisel's experience. Now let's see what I'm talking about. I say this new project presented him with an obstacle. Okay, so now I'm contrasting, right? He's got a lot of experience. He's really good at what he's doing, but now he's experiencing an obstacle. That's contrast. Therefore, I want to contrast the two sentences with the word however. Okay, we're marking a change. All right, answer choices B, C, and D. I'll tell you why they're wrong as well. At any rate, that's not applicable here. Answer choice C. Furthermore, we're not adding on to something. We're showing a contrast. We're showing a change in direction, right? He was good at something. Now he has a challenge. And then, for example, we didn't introduce a challenge in our previous sentence, so we can't use for example for number six. All right, reading on, we have Spalding told Geisel to write his entire book using a restricted vocabulary from an elementary school list of 348 words. Geisel started two stories only to abandon them when he found that he needed to use words that were not on the list. On the verge of giving up, okay, now this right here, what I'm underlining in blue, or I'm going to box it up, that's an introductory modifying clause. Now, who is it modifying? Well, it's modifying Geisel. It's not modifying Geisel's story. 
So we need to start seven with Geisel. Anything that doesn't start with Geisel, we can get rid of. So we can get rid of A because it's Geisel's story. Okay, we're modifying Geisel, not his story. And we see our answer there's got to be C. So it'll be Geisel finally hit upon the image that became the basis for his story. A cat wearing a battered stovepipe hat. His main character established, Geisel commenced the difficult task of writing a book with a limited vocabulary. Okay, answer, and now we got question eight. At the end of a duration, nine months long. Well, that's super wordy. It's super repetitive, super redundant. We want to break that down into something where we're only talking about the length of time once. So we can get rid of A. We're going we're gonna to have to make a change here. If we look at answer choice B, it says after 36 weeks or nine months. Once again, that's the same period of time. We can get rid of it. C, after a length of nine months had elapsed. Elapsed in length of time. All of that is redundant, repetitive, wordy, inconcise. And then answer choice D, nine months later, that's really efficient, has good diction. It's very concise. So that'll be our answer for number eight. All right, the book was a hit. Children were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat. And now keep in mind, right here, we're looking to uh, for parallelism, right? We have the children were entertained, right? We got to maintain uh, this tense and the number, okay? So the children were entertained, and then it should be and captivated. So we're going to delete the underlying portion. We wouldn't say and was captivated or and has been captivated. We already have this were, which is going to apply to entertained and to captivated. So we just got to make sure that we're maintaining uh, the, t the tense and uh, the number with entertained and captivated, which we are in answer choice D. We don't want to have anything between it, okay? So answer for number nine there is going to be D. All right, its sales inspired another publishing company, Random House, to establish a series of early a series for early readers called Beginner Books, which featured works by guys and other writers, and other publishers quickly followed suit. In the years that followed, okay, in the years that followed is not an independent clause, so we can't have a period after it. We also can't have a semicolon after it. Okay, and we also can't have that dash after it. So we can go ahead and get rid of A, B, and D. Answer, there's got to be C. We've got uh, an introductory, um, not, I'm sorry, we have uh, a clause that needs to have a comma after it, beginning of a sentence, introductory clause, got to have that comma. Okay, so our answer there's going to be C for number 10. All right, moving on. We've got many talented writers and illustrated of children's books imitated Geisel's formula of restricted vocabulary and whimsical artwork, but perhaps the best proof of the cat in the hat success is not in its influence on other books, but now we got question number 11. So we're going to be looking to sum up uh, this entire passage, right? We, and keep in mind, we also are going to have to go back and answer two as well. So we have the writer wants a conclusion that restates the main themes of the passage, which choice best accomplishes this goal. Well, the whole point of this isn't about, you know, how he was able to do this with limited vocabulary and appealing word choices. It's not about sales either. What it's about is it's about teaching children to read through these engaging books with illustrations in them. Okay, it's also not about the important role of history and illustrations, so our answer is going to be C, the enduring ability to delight children and engage them in learning how to read. That's the theme of this. Now, keep in mind, we skipped over two because we had to read on throughout the passage. So let's go ahead and go back and answer this. So it says the writer wants to include a quotation by Hersey that supports the topic of the passage, which choice best accomplishes this goal. All right, well, what's the topic about? It's not about an individual's. It's an, uh, I'll go ahead and give you the full independent clause so you can see it. Okay, we've got one solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting. Okay, and it's not anything to do with wholeness or what follows or any sort of accomplishments. We can go and get rid of A. We want to talk about the illustrations and how he's making the books more interesting so children are more engaged and want to learn to read more. Okay, it's choice B says interesting since learning starts with failure. Okay, that's not true. The first failure is the beginning of education. Not true. As for choice C, interesting because journalism allows its readers to witness history. We don't want to focus in on journalism there, so we can go ahead and get rid of C. And then we're left with answer choice D as our correct answer, which is interesting with drawings like those of the wonderfully imaginated geniuses among children's illustrators, which is what we talk about with Dr. Seuss and his illustrations. So our answer for two is D. All right, so now we are done with passage one. Let's go ahead and move on to passage number two now. So we've got questions 12 to 22 are based on the following passage. We have keep student volunteering voluntary. A growing number of public schools in the United States require students to complete community service hours to graduate. Such volunteering, be it helping at a local animal, animal shelter, and then this is going to have to be picking up litter. The reason I know that is because this question is testing parallelism, and we see that we had helping, we have working, therefore we have to have picking up. Okay, We have to maintain the number and tense in our verbs to create that consistency and that parallelism, therefore answer for 12 is D. Moving on, we have... Uh, or working at a healthcare facility it has obvious benefits for the community it serves and teaches students important life skills. But critics say that making volunteerism compulsory misses the point of the act. Now we have the writer wants to transition from the previous paragraph that highlights the criticism of compulsory volunteering mentioned in the previous paragraph. Well, what's that criticism? It's that by making it mandatory, we are missing. And I'm going to put this in green so you can see what I'm referring to. By making it voluntary, I'm sorry, by making it mandatory, we're missing the point of volunteering, which is that it's voluntary. Okay, so it would be by its very definition. So our answer there for 13 is going to be no change. All right, moving on, we've got, uh, we've got by requiring students to do community service in order to graduate school officials. Okay, keep in mind the officials don't own anything, so we know no change is wrong. We shouldn't have an apostrophe 
with officials are taking away students' choice. Students do possess that choice. Keep in mind, we're referring to multiple students, so the apostrophe has to come after the S, so we can get rid of C. We do have to have an apostrophe, so we can get rid of B. Answer there's going to be D. To give up their time for nonprofit activities, making volunteerism less meaningful and pleasurable, according to a physical psychological concept called the reactance theory, the loss of freedom in choosing an activity can cause a negative reaction. For instance, instead of focusing on the good they are doing, students may become resentful of the demands that compulsory volunteering places on their schedules. Proponents of compulsory volunteering who are in favor of it. Okay, when we say proponents of compulsory volunteering, that's telling us they're in favor of it. So we don't need to say that again. So we can go ahead and get rid of uh, advocating it as well and its advocates. Once again, we can get rid of that. We want to avoid repetition and redundancy. If you can avoid repetition and redundancy on the SAT writing section, you will do much better than if you don't. Okay, now we've got point out that it allows young people to garner the benefits that volunteering offers. Students who volunteer report increased self-esteem. Okay, now we're getting into a list, so we want to pay attention for parallelism. Increased self-esteem, better relationship and building skills, or better relationship building skills, and now keep in mind, those were both positive things. We need another positive thing in 16. Increasingly busy schedules is not positive. A closer connection with the community is positive. That'll be our answer. C, less time and social activities, not positive. And then D, little increase in academic achievement, also not positive. So our answer is B. All right, some studies have also found that students who do community service are more likely to volunteer as adults, and thus this has to be a fact. Okay, we need the verb here, okay? They are, they are affecting society. Effect is a noun. We need to show a verb for the impact they have on society. Therefore, our answer there is B. Okay, the reason that it's not affex is because it's the students, okay? So we have students affect society, okay? If it was a singular person, for example, if we were to say he, then it would be he affects, he affects, right? Okay, but in this case, we have students, therefore we need affect. All right, moving on, we've got number 18. Did I read through that? Okay, I did. All right, number 18, we have, however, most research looks at students who volunteer in general, not making a distinction between those who are required to volunteer by their schools and those who volunteer willingly. One recent study by Sarah E. Helms, assistant professor of economics at Stanford University in Birmingham, Alabama, did study specifically on mandatory volunteering. In this case, we're looking at a word choice question because it's one word underlined in the middle of a sentence. And mandatory is the correct word, right? We're, refer we're referring to volunteering that is required. It's not forcible. It's not coercive. It's not imperative. We're talking about volunteering that's required or mandatory. So our answer is A. She found that students who were required to volunteer rushed to complete their service hours early in high school. Okay, that's an independent clause. I'm going to mark that with IC. Then we have, they then did significantly less regular volunteer work in 12th grade, and then we're comparing it to something, but that's going to be another independent clause. So we're looking to connect two independent clauses. Now, the reason that we can't do it with a period, well, we could, but the issue with C is that we have they and then comma then. We can't put a comma in between they and then. C's wrong. Okay, if we take a look at answer choice B, we have a comma after they then. We can't do that either, so B is wrong. Okay, looking at answer choice A, we can't connect two independent clauses with only a comma and no fanboy. Therefore, our answer's got to be D. We use that semicolon to connect the two independent clauses, and then we have they then with no commas that are messing it up. All right, moving on from there, we've got they then did less regular volunteer work in a 12th grade. Then this should be those who did not volunteer, right? So we have to keep in mind that we need to compare students, and I'm going to put this in green so you see what I'm referring to. We need to compare students who were required to volunteer to students who were not required to volunteer. Okay, so we see that we have that in answer choice B. Okay, then did students who were not required to volunteer. Okay, we need to compare those two things. We always have to compare like things together. So our answer there is going to have to be answer choice B for number 20. All right, moving on, we have Helms concluded that compulsory volunteering does not necessarily create lifelong volunteers. Instead of requiring students to volunteer, schools have to recognize, uh, it looks like we're asked for which choice most effectively sets up the point made in the next sentence. Let's go and find the next sentence. Many studies show that when schools simply tell students about opportunities for community service and connect them with organizations that need help, more students volunteer of their own free will. All right, so instead of requiring students to volunteer, schools should do what then? Well, they should focus on offering opportunities to volunteer that make it easy and attractive because, as we see in what I'm going to put in green here, that next sentence, that next sentence is telling us students will, they will take advantage of those opportunities if you present them to them. Okay, so schools need to focus on showing students those opportunities. If we take a look at answer choice A, A would say I have to recognize that not all students are uh, equally suited to all activities. That's not true. Um, or it may be true, but it's not the point of the essay. All right, and it's not setting up the example in the next sentence. That's the key part. It's not setting up the example in the next sentence. B should allow students to spend their time participating in athletics and other extracurricular activities. This essay isn't about that, and also that next sentence isn't about that either. And then D, are advised to recognize the limits of their ability and to influence students. Once again, that's not setting up our next sentence. The only sentence in answer choice is A through D that is setting up our next sentence is answer choice C. All right, moving on to 22. The writer wants a conclusion that states the main claim of the passage. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? All right, well, think about it for a minute. What's the main claim of this passage? 
It's that volunteering shouldn't be required. Volunteering shouldn't be forced. So we want to find an answer choice that says that, that says that schools should present opportunities to volunteer but not require it. So answer choice A says it's imperative that schools do their part to find volunteers for the many worthwhile organizations in the U.S. That's not the main idea. And then C, and answer choice B, schools that do this will produce more engaged, enthusiastic volunteers than schools that require volunteer work. Yes, because when you take that into account with what was said in the previous sentence, saying that schools should tell students about these opportunities for community service and connect them with organizations, now we're saying schools that do that will produce more engaged, enthusiastic volunteers than schools that require volunteer work. So our answer there is going to be B. Okay, answer choice C, studies in the field of psychology and economics have revolutionized a researcher's understanding. No, that's not the main idea here. This is an argumentative essay. And then in answer choice D, it's important students choose charitable work uh, that suits their interests and values. It's not the main idea here. All right, moving on to passage number three, marsupials lend a hand to science. Marsupials, mammals that carry their young in a pouch, are a curiosity among biologists because they lack a corpus callosum, the collection of nerve fibers connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. In most other mammals, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body, the right hemisphere controls the left, and the corpus callosum allows communication between the hemispheres. Next, we have scientists, and then we have our long believing. Now, this is a question that's testing me on my ability to recognize the tense, okay? We have to identify the correct tense. I know this because all of these words are using the same uh, the same verbs, right? And then you got adverbs. So you're really just dealing with identifying the correct tense here. Now, in this case, we know that scientists have believed this in the past and they also still believe it, okay? So it, the correct answer here that's showing that they believed it in the past and they still do is have long believed, okay? So our answer there has to be answer choice C. Answer choice B says, will long be believing? That's not telling us they believed it in the past, which they have, so B is incorrect. Long believe, once again, not telling us they believed it in the past. And then answer choice A, are long believing? Once again, not telling us that they believed this in the past as well. Okay, scientists have long believed that the structure enables complex tasks to be sequestering, uh, enables complex complex tasks by sequestering skilled movement to a single hemisphere without sacrificing coordination between both sides of the body. This sequestration would explain handedness, the tendency to prefer one hand over the other in humans. Now keep in mind that after handedness, we have that comma and we also have it before humans because what I'm about to underline in blue here, okay, what I'm underlining in blue is a non-essential phrase or clause. All right, so that's just one thing to know. Now, what we're gonna put for 24, okay, we wanna be as concise as we can. If we look at answer choices B and C, we see they're really wordy, really inefficient. B says in favor of the use of one hand over the other, Okay, that's not efficient word choice. Once again, we already said the word consistently prefer, so saying favor would be redundant. Okay, and then when we say at the end of C that would be chosen, we already said that they would prefer, which is indicating that they would choose it. So once again, that'd be being redundant. And then looking at A versus answer choice D, saying on a regular basis is repeating that phrase consistently prefer. Consistently is telling us they do this on a regular basis. Therefore, our answer has to be A because there's no repetition, no redundancy. All right, moving on to 25, we have, however, a recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum, and then it's going to say something, okay? Now, in this case, we would not need any punctuation after trait. They're just testing you to make sure that you're not throwing in random punctuation, okay? In this case, we don't have a separation of an independent clause from anything else after the word trait, so we just want to answer with A. We don't want to add anything that doesn't need to be there, okay? And nothing has to be after or before trait, so our answer there is A for 25. Okay, so going back and reading through the sentence again, we have, however, recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum, and then we have links as handedness. Okay, we want to talk about how it correlates with handedness. Okay, we're not saying that it correlates from handedness. Okay, you wouldn't say something correlates from something else. Okay, that's not idiomatic. And then saying something links on or links as, once again, we would not say that either. Okay, you could say something is linked with handedness, but you wouldn't say that it links as or links on. Okay, so our answer there's got to be B. That's showing the correct relationship between handedness and the presence of a corpus callosum. All right, moving on. We got researchers at St. Petersburg State University and the University of Tasmania observed marsupials walking on either two legs, bipeds, or four legs, quadrupeds, and performing such tasks as bringing food to their mouths. The scientists employed a mean handedness index. Now we're asked which choice accurately reflects information in the graph. Well, let's take a quick look at the graph, see what it says. I see that left forelimb preference is associated with positive values. Now, in contrast, and let me go ahead and switch my pen to a different color so you can see this. I see that right forelimb preference is indicated with negative values on the mean handedness index. Okay, keep in mind this is on the mean handedness index. So if I go back up to question 27, I got to find an answer choice that shows that. Answer choice A says negative scores are indicating a left forelimb preference, which is the reverse relationship from what the graph is showing. Answer choice B says scores of zero or less indicate a left forelimb preference. We know that it indicates a right forelimb preference. So B is incorrect. C, positive scores indicate a lack of forelimb preference. That's incorrect as well. Correct answer is D, positive scores are indicating that left forelimb preference, negative scores indicating a right forelimb preference. Now we have while eating the eastern gray kangaroo and red-necked wallaby, red kangaroo, we should have a comma after kangaroo because 
before the word and because we have a list of four. Now before that last term, we do have to have the word and, but we need the comma to come before the word and. So our correct answer there is gonna be B. That's simply uh, you know the grammar rules of having a list. Next we have preferred using their left forelimb as revealed by, well, if they're preferring to use their left forelimb, it's gonna be revealed by a positive mean handis in, handedness index, which is gonna be a value that's positive. Now this says values less than 0.2 for all four species. We see that's not true. We see that they are all between 0.4 and 0.6. So our correct answer there, is gonna be answer choice C, okay? Positive mean handedness index values between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. So these results suggest handedness among uh, these animals. Moving down, we got question 30. Okay, now we have something introducing quadruped marsupials. Now this is gonna be an introductory modifying phrase or clause, okay? So we need whatever is in that underlined portion to directly modify quadrupedal, quadrupedal marsupials. So we're asked which choice best, provides the best transition from the previous paragraph. Now, keep in mind that it could be an introductory modifying clause. It can also be something that's providing um, a transition from the previous paragraph. In this case, it has to do both, okay? It's got a both transition from the previous paragraph. Also, it's an introductory modifying clause to quadruple marsupials. Now, if we look at a choice at answer choice A, we have having four feet. That's true, but it's not transitioning from our previous paragraph, so A is incorrect. B, like most other mammals, well, once again, that's not that's A, uh, that's not necessarily true because we just talked about biped, bipedal marsupials having a strong preference for one use of a forelimb. So that's just incorrect. And then C, in contrast to their bipedal counterparts, okay, that's directly applying to the quadruple marsupials, and it's also providing a great transition from our previous paragraph, so C will be our correct answer. Answer choice D, while well, using their forelimbs for eating, that's not transitioning from our previous paragraph, so our answer's gotta be C. Right, moving on, we got, for instance, a gray short-tailed opossums and sugar gliders were assigned mean-handed index, index close values, very close to zero. They use their right and left forelimbs nearly equally. In effect, the study provided no evidence of handedness among quadrupedal marsupials. Moving down, we've got a, uh, we're told which choice presents a main claim of the passage. All right, well, we know our main claim of the passage is dealing with handedness um, versus not having handedness between marsupials and bipedals. All right, so if we take a look at our answer choices, we have A, kangaroos, those still do not exhibit handedness to the extent humans do. That's getting off topic. That's not dealing with our main claim. Okay, key part there is main claim, not a subclaim, main claim. B, for the marsupials in the study, then handedness seems to be associated with bipedalism. Yes, that's true, okay? We talked about how quadrupedals don't seem to have handedness, but bipedals do. Okay, answer choice C, there are many things scientists do not understand about the marsupial brain, no. And then D, additional studies on this phenomenon will need to be performed with other animals, no. Keep in mind, once you find your right answer, like once I found B was my correct answer, I wouldn't read C or D if I was actually taking the SAT because it's a waste of my time and I wanna be as efficient as I can. But because I'm teaching this to you, that's why I'm showing you why incorrect answers are incorrect. Okay, so keep that in mind as well as I go through this. Moving on, we have, as the researcher noted, the quadrupeds typically live in trees and employ all four limbs in climbing. The bipeds, on the other hand, are far less arboreal, leaving their forelimbs relatively free for tasks. This is going to be in which handedness, okay? Tasks in which handedness, okay? In which, this which is referring to the tasks, okay? So we wouldn't say tasks in whom because tasks isn't a person, okay? Tasks also, we wouldn't say uh, whose, once again, not a person. We would say in which, okay? Why is it which versus what? We use which in this case for a couple of reasons. One, we know what we're referring to, okay? We see that it's tasks in which, so we know we're referring to tasks, and then we go on to even narrow that down more as we read through the rest of the sentence. Additionally, you're never really gonna wanna use what in the middle of a sentence. Most of the time, if you're going to use what, it's gonna be at the beginning of a sentence, and it's gonna be in a question where there's some unlimited possibilities or unlimited outcomes, whereas you would use which when it's more narrowed down, like it's going to be in the middle of a sentence. So if you're having the case where it's in the middle of a sentence, you're pretty much always gonna use which, you're almost never gonna use what, and if it's at the beginning of a sentence and it's in a question, then yes, you could possibly use which, you could also possibly use but, but in this case, we know it's gonna be which because it's in the middle of a sentence and we know what we're referring to. Sorry, my camera just cut out after I answered 32, so let's go ahead and get started with 33. So we've got why the majority of marsupials studied preferred their left forelimbs, while well, the majority of humans preferred their right remains a mystery. However, then we're told the writer wants to conclude the passage by recalling a topic from the first paragraph that requires additional research. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? Well, if you think about the first paragraph, what were we talking about? We were talking about how marsupials don't have a corpus callosum and how it's unclear how their left and right sides of the brain are communicating with each other. And I can go ahead and show you that as well, okay? I'm going to quick show you that really quickly here, okay? We can see that that's going to be right where I'm going to put green, okay? I'll underline it in green. So we've got, in most other mammals, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body, right hemisphere controls the left, and the corpus callosum allows communication between the two, all right? Now, if you go down at the end, it says, a recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum links handedness, okay? All right, so now if we go ahead and move down, we want to connect that in to this last sentence, 
Okay, so to conclude the passage then, we should say answer choice A, which says, as does the mechanism by which, in the absence of a corpus callosum, the hemispheres of the marsupial brain communicate. So as we can see, answer choice A is what's referencing that topic that needs additional research from that first paragraph. Key part there being that it does need additional research because they're not totally sure how it works right now. Answer choice is B through D. I'll go ahead and show you why those are wrong as well. B says, though researchers should not neglect the sizable minority of humans who are left-handed, that's off topic and is not a... Uh, main idea in the first paragraph, nor does it need additional research. C, ed, scientists believe that studies like this one may someday yield insights into the causes of certain neurological disorders. Once again, that's not concluding the passage by recalling that topic from the first paragraph that we said requires additional research. Same thing with D. It says, and an additional study is planned to study handedness and other animals that stand upright only some of the time. That's not talking about the topic from the first paragraph that needs more research. All right, moving on to our last passage. So we have an employee benefit that benefits employers. Key thing to do with this passage that I want to point out is if you ever see a one at the top of the paragraph, it's telling you you're going to be doing something with the paragraph. So if you see a one in front of the first sentence, okay, and around sentences throughout the paragraph, then you're dealing within one paragraph. Now, when I see a one above a paragraph, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the last question for that passage, because that's going to tell me what I'm doing as far as placing something or rearranging paragraphs, because sometimes you may need to rearrange paragraphs, and it's important that you go to that question first to save time. So we have, the writer wants to insert the following sense. Still, since securing an excellent workforce is crucial to a business's success, employers should give serious thought to investing in reimbursement programs. To make the passage most logical, the sentence should be placed immediately after the last sentence in paragraph what? All right, well, what I want to do here is I just want to identify what should come before it, because it's going at the last sentence of the paragraph. I don't need to identify what should come after. Okay, so just what comes before. So with before it, we have still, since securing an excellent workforce is crucial to business success. Employers should give serious thought to investing in reimbursement programs. All right, well, this is a transition right here. Okay, when we go still since securing an excellent workforce is crucial to business success, that's telling me that before this, we were probably talking about um, some sort of argument or counter argument to what our main claim is, right? Our main claiming that main claim being, and I'll go ahead and put the main claim in green here, that employers should give serious thought to investing in reimbursement programs. So before that, I'd be wanting to talk about a counter argument as to um, something about why people may not want to invest in a reimbursement program. So that's going to kind of help me place this as I go. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started then going from the first question. Okay. And then we'll just, if we find a spot to place it as we go through, it'll be great. And we probably will since we know what to look for before it. So that's why we do that. All right. Because it makes it so we don't have to go back and reread re the whole passage again because we're going to place it as we go. But anyway, so let's go ahead and get started. We have, according to a 2014 report from the study of human resource management, 54% of surveyed companies provide tuition assistance to employees pursuing an undergraduate degree, and 50% do so for employees working toward a graduate degree. Okay, next up, I've got words at the beginning of a sentence followed by a comma. In this case, it says, despite these findings, I'm, I know I'm looking to transition from my previous paragraph, or I'm sorry, my previous sentence into my next sentence. Next sentence says, more companies should consider helping employees pay for education, and so on. All right. Well, we're showing in our previous sentence that a lot of companies are already providing tuition assistance. Now we're saying that more companies should, okay? So we're saying a good transition here would be, although these levels are impressive, right? We've got 50% um, are doing so, that's impressive, but we want more to do it, okay? So our answer there for a good transition would be C. If we take a look at B, we've got, in addition to the 2014 report, okay, we're not providing another source, so we wouldn't say that. And it's choice A, despite these findings, we're not contradicting the findings, so we wouldn't say that. And then whether they want to or not, once again, whether they want to or not is kind of irrelevant. We're making the argument, okay, that although these levels are impressive, more companies should. Okay, so we, we wouldn't be saying whether they want to or not. All right, also, yeah, I'm just going to leave it there. All right, and then 35, we've got more companies should consider helping employees pay for education because doing so helps increase customer satisfaction. That's definitely not going to be what we're looking at here. It says which choice most effectively establishes the main idea of the passage. We're probably going to have to read on before we answer this one because we don't know the main idea of the passage quite yet, so we'll come back to that one. So we have tuition reimbursement programs signal that employers offer their workers opportunities. Okay, workers doesn't own the opportunities, so we can go ahead and get rid of D and A. All right, and then we've got uh, opportunities doesn't own anything either, so our answer there's got to be C for 36 for personal and professional development. According to Professor of Management Peter Capelli, such opportunities are appealing to highly motivated, disciplined individuals and may attract applicants with these desirable qualities. Many in the business community concur. Explaining his company's decision to expand its tuition assistance program, John Fox, the director of dealer training at Fiat Chrysler Automobiles in the United States, and this is going to be stressed. We already said who it was. We said it was John Fox. We don't need to say who before it. Okay, we also wouldn't say that he's stressing something. This is past tense. He did it. This is a quote. Okay. He already said this in the past. Okay. And we wouldn't all, we also wouldn't say, and he's stressed because once again, we already know who that is. So this is in the past. It's a quote. We know who it is. It's not present. So we wouldn't say stressing. Correct answer. There's going to be B. 
All right, moving on. He said, this is a benefit that can surely bring top talent to our dealers. So showing that tuition reimbursement is a positive thing. Paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees. Okay, I see I have retaining employees. I know I'm gonna have to connect these two. Um, I can go ahead and get rid of retaining employees because I already said retain employees. I don't wanna repeat that. Um, so I'd wanna say here, after saying employees, I'd wanna have a comma and I'd wanna have the word uh, which because when we read on, it says which is important not only because uh, it ensures a skilled and experienced workforce and then it keeps talking, right? But point is, we don't want to say the retaining of whom. We don't want to say retention again. Both of those are repetitive and redundant. We also don't want to start with that in a sentence, right? We wouldn't want to do a semicolon that. We'd want to do a comma, which, okay? Anytime that you have a situation where you're combining sentences like this, you have a term that's repeated. In this case, it's retain employees. Look to get rid of that second term. And then generally what you're going to want to do is most of the time look to put a comma and then either which, if it's, um, if that fits with that second part, or if you said, you know, a person in the previous one, and you're saying a person again, do a comma and then a who, um, or something like that. All right, moving on to 39. So we've got, uh, but also because it mitigates the considerable cost of finding, hiring, and training new workers. Employees whose tuition is often is reimbursed often stay with their employer even after they complete their degrees. Okay, we don't want to start, we can't start a sentence with the word because. Okay, so we can go ahead and get rid of A right off the bat. Also, when you have a subordinate conjunction, that means that you don't need something between it, okay? From because all the way to the end of that sentence, that's a dependent clause. When you have a dependent clause after an independent clause, like we do in question 39, we don't need punctuation between them. So our correct answer is gonna be C for 39. Next, we have the career of Valerie Lincoln, an employee at the aerospace company, United Technologies Corporation. We need to have a comma after uh, that parentheses UTC. The reason behind that is it's a non-essential phrase or clause, as I'll show you. We have the career of Valerie Lincoln followed by a comma. Then we have an employee at the aerospace company, United Technologies Corporation. If we were to just go ahead and remove, and I'll just put in green what I'd be removing. Okay, if we were to move all that, we still got a full sentence. So it's a non-essential phrase or clause. Since we offset it with a comma after Lincoln, we need to offset a comma after parentheses UTC. So our answer there's got to be answer choice D. All right, moving on to question number 41. So we've got in eight years at UTC, or is a significant success story for a company's tuition reimbursement program. In eight years at UTC, Lincoln earned associate and bachelor's degrees in business and advanced from an administrative assistant position to an accounting associate position. This allowed UTC to retain an employee with deep knowledge in her industry and years of valuable experience. Keep in mind, we've got one word, middle of a sentence, and then we have, for our answer choices, different words, right? Completely different words, not just a changing of tense, not just a changing of ending, not just a changing of number. So we know that we are looking for the word that, you know, is both fitting with the tone of the passage and also providing the most accurate definition here, right? In this case, she has a deep knowledge. We wouldn't say it's a hidden knowledge. We wouldn't say it's a large knowledge. We wouldn't say it's spacious. We would say it's a deep knowledge in her industry. Okay, so our answer there would be A. So that's a word choice question. All right, now we got Tuition reimbursement can be expensive and many companies would find it impractical to pay for multiple degrees for all employees. Businesses have succeeded in minimizing keeping down costs. Those are the same thing. We're being repetitive, so A is going to be incorrect. We want to only say minimizing costs or keeping down costs. We can't say them both. So we see B and C, they're both also repetitive and redundant. Only answer choice that isn't repetitive and redundant is going to be answer choice D. Always avoid repetition and redundancy. If that's one thing that you're going to take away from this video, take away that. Please avoid repetition and redundancy at all costs. All right, moving on to 43. So we've got uh, keeping down costs and ensuring the relevance of employees' coursework by offering fixed amounts of reimbursement each year and stipulating which subjects workers can study. Even with these methods, tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases, especially if classes are likely to divert employees' time and energy from jobs. Now, just by reading through that sentence, you could tell it's really smooth. No need for any change in 43. If we were to change it, we'd be using the wrong tense. In this case, we need the infinitive form of the verb. All right, in this case, that's going to be to, ver to divert. Okay, that's the infinitive form. All right, next up, we got to keep in mind, we have to go back and answer that question at the beginning. We also got to answer 44, but I know that we had skipped over 35 because we wanted to find the main idea of the passage first. And the main idea is that they're going to be able to not only um, improve the quality of the company's business, but they're going to be able to attract and retain employees. Answer choice D, that was the main idea um, of this passage. Okay, now we can go down and answer 44. Now, if you notice in 43, that last sentence of this, uh, of this passage, we saw a counter argument. Okay, we're saying that it's not appropriate in all cases to use tuition reimbursement. Now, would we ever want to end on a counter argument? No, we don't want to ever end on a counter argument. We want to end on the main idea of our argument, right? We want to push it forward. And we do that 
with this sentence in 44. So we're gonna wanna place that after our last paragraph, which is paragraph four. So our answer there would be D. Hopefully this video is helpful. If it was, make sure to like and subscribe. In addition to that, if you're gaining value from my content, please consider donating. It helps me to be able to continue to put out these videos for free. And in addition to that, if you're looking for private SAT prep, college essay editing, or college admissions consulting, be sure to check out my website. The link is in the description.